Hi, I'm Lynn Sachs, and I'm giving you this video talk instead of being with you because of our current situation with the coronavirus. The talk that I want to present to you today is called My Body, Your Body, Our Bodies, Somatic Cinema at Home and in the World. And the reason I even wanted to make this talk was because it occurred to me that ever since I started making films, which was in the early 80s, I've been shooting images of the body, other people's bodies, and my bodies. My body, I only have one. But in the process, I was constantly thinking about the way that the body is framed. I was trying to understand how I would direct someone or how I would move in front of the camera myself in a way that spoke from a feminist experience, but also an, an experience of someone who was constantly asking and wondering, what is it to be in a movie? What is it to place a body in front of a lens, both politically, conceptually, aesthetically, uh, and, and um, that, those are the levels that I was trying to explore it. So I thought that I would go through my early films and all the way up to my most recent films and try to talk to you about these issues on the le level of gender and race, uh, looking at cross generations, and try to figure out how these uh, questions can manifest themselves in the, the work itself. So the first film I want to show you is called Drawn and Quartered. This is a film I made in 1986 with a small wind-up camera that my Uncle Charlie gave me because I was just getting started in filmmaking and he thought he would just hand off this old camera that he'd been using for home movies to me to make some art project. So this is the film I made in San Francisco and here we go.
So I'm going to tell you a few stories about drawn and quartered. First of all, as I mentioned before, this was a camera that was given to me by my great uncle. Well, the way that you shoot the, the, uh, the intention for the film when you shoot with regular eight is that you shoot on one side of a reel and then you turn it over and shoot on the other. But I started to think what would happen if we don't split the film down the middle and then you end up with four quadrants at once. I think this was probably the second time that I'd ever used a camera, but I decided already that I was an experimental filmmaker, so I didn't want to do it the normal way. Uh, so anyway, I was in graduate school at the time and I had a boyfriend and his name was John and I said, will you come on the roof with me of the San Francisco Art Institute and we're going to try to explore some ideas I have about filmmaking. First of all, I was really keen on doing something that would break what Laura Mulvey, the theorist and feminist thinker had come up with. She said, talked about visual pleasure. And she had said, well, if you have a camera in the 20th century, you're always going to be conditioned by what the, the sort of male ethos of narrative cinema had prescribed. Therefore, even if you were a woman holding a camera, standing behind the lens, you were still going to frame other women's bodies as if you were a man. So I wanted to try to break that. I was also very influenced by my viewing of Carolee Schneeman's film Fuses, which was made by Carolee and her partner, lover at the time, and they were uh, on a bed and they were each shooting images of one another and it was all supposed to be from the point of view of a cat but it was supposed to be this kind of non-gendered way of framing the body so i had seen carol lee's film i had read laura's laura mulvey's essay on visual pleasure and the narrative and all of that was feeding my making of drawn and quartered which you just saw the only problem was i wasn't that accustomed to being nude in front of a camera. So when I got the film footage back and I was really excited about it, but I was feeling kind of shy. So I went through all the film footage, which was actual film. So this predates non-destructive digital editing. So if I were to cut out my face, which I did, then you would see the splices. So I made the whole film without my face in it and I showed it to some friends and they all said I was a coward. So then I had to put it back in. So what you saw basically was the second version of the film, the version that is the finished film, but the version with my face that was terrifying, but also took me into a new phase of my own filmmaking. So the next film I'm gonna show you is called Still Life with Woman and Four Objects. Now this film was actually my most complex film of the time. It's four minutes in total. But um, I had recently seen Yvonne Rayner's film, which is called a uh, film about a woman who, and in that film, she really also takes big leaps uh, in terms of how she looked at women on screen, but also how she looked at narrative. And she wanted to think about the structure of narrative and why it is that we're so indebted to plot and how we work with characters and how we think about what is going on inside characters' heads and how we move away from literature. So I had all of these ideas in my head. And so now you're gonna see Still Life with Woman and Four Objects. It's the texture, that's it. The way the food feels just before I swallow. No, that's not it. This memory has a taste that. Her picture. Dear Sasha. Dear Ben. Dearest Claudia. May 1st, 1886, letter to a lover. An anarchist, a communist, a free thinker, a teacher. Part of a story, no, part of a life. Began reading her letters when I was trying I to. I can't understand why she left. All I know is that she died. For women too.
Okay, so Still Life with Women and Four Objects. Uh, oh, actually is paired with another film that I made called Following the Object to Its Logical Beginning. That was a film I made following a man, but this one I'm still trying to follow the life of a woman. And I wanted to tell you a few things about this film. So there was another woman, the star of Still Life with Women and Four Objects. Her name is Zemia, as you saw. Well, that or in the credits, you didn't see it. But anyway, uh, Zemia was a little bit older than I was, and I was really awed by her. And I thought, you know what? I don't want her to just be in my film like an object, the way you would have a lamp, or you might have a vase, or you might have a table. I want her to contribute. I was thinking, how could an actor be more than a prop? How could an actor come to a set and make it different from how it was before the actor arrived? So I said to Zimya, will you bring an object from your life that means something to you? And she brought a picture of Emma Goldman. Now, I was about 24 at the time, and I did not know who Emma Goldman, Goldman was. Or, and so I had to ask her, and she explained to me that Emma Goldman was a very important early 20th century anarchist and a woman who fought for women's rights, for suffrage, for all the different things that are, and, and, and also reproductive rights mostly. But Emma Golden's photograph enters my film and it changes my whole thinking about how uh, objects can can bring like can infuse a project infuse the meaning of a film and not just become part of a set so i had emma goldman also another thing that was really important to me which you saw was that i wanted to show act people eating specifically women eating because i thought Eating is such a big part of our life. It's very much about the body. It's about cravings. It's about desires. And it's what we have to do. But so often, women are not showed eating in a film. So in this film, you saw Zemia, my star, eating, but you don't see her head. So she's, in a sense, decapitated. She's removed from her body, but yet she's filling her body. And those were some of the things that I was trying to think about. One other thing that I wanted to mention was that I, like I said, this is very early in my film career. I'm a graduate student and I'm introduced to Jean-Luc Godard. So Godard is another one of these filmmakers who is so committed to disrupting conventional narrative filmmaking, but he's also very much a part of it. He's making big commercial movies in a sense in Europe and they're asking us to think in new ways about politics. And in all of that, he's, he's both working with the form and the content. But one thing that Godard didn't do was he didn't challenge the kind of stereotypical vision or, or, or representation of women on the screen. So while I was so drawn to Jean-Luc Godard, I was also very, very upset by the way that he showed women's bodies. So I wanted to be able to show a woman's body, her, her shape, her, her breasts, her figure, but to show it in a compassionate and loving way rather than an objectifying way. The next film you're gonna see is called Sermons and Sacred Pictures. And this is a film I made on the life and work of Reverend L. O. Taylor, who was an African-American minister and filmmaker who made movies in Memphis, Tennessee, which is my hometown, in the 1930s and 40s. That was where a lot of the black secretaries were trained through the Henderson Business School. And he has a film of them typing there to music while someone is playing the piano. It's 
during that period of time when he was uh, filming, because of the situation, like in the South, you had the Black Chamber of Commerce, the Black Old Folks on the Welfare League, every, they had duplicated all the city services, which they couldn't get. He had documented all of this here. Kids, you know, imagine the fascinations of letting of little kids when they get a chance to get under this black cloak and look through there and see these people upside down that he's about to take pictures of. And, and kids were just enamored with that. And all of the photographers that they'd ever seen were white who didn't bother to show little black kids how how the thing, the vision looks through the camera lens and that kind of thing. And so he was always doing something like I say, little kids riding on the running board of the cars because their parents didn't have cars. Excerpt from Sermons and Sacred Pictures. One of the conceits that I had for this film was that Reverend Taylor was shooting from the inside out. And I wanted to try to understand what that meant because going all the way back to the the work project association were coming out of the depression when people were going down to, for example, to uh, to the South and shooting f movies of the South, but they were white, usually white photographers shooting images of black communities in rural America. And there was this sense of they were shooting from the outside in. And I was really moved by the fact that Reverend Taylor was a member of uh, <clears throat> a congregation and of a, a city community, but that he was documenting his congregation, his friends, his family, people on football teams, people, uh, the first people who, uh, women to start, black women to start a typing school, which you saw, or a, a beauty parlor. And he was, so when he was there, he was behind the camera. And when his subjects were looking at the camera, they were looking at someone they knew really well. And that was a whole kind of disruption of the documentary paradigm of shooting from the outside in. So I was really excited to see that. The other thing that I wanted to show in my movie was something that was really important to him, which was bringing the films back to a community and to think about how audiences would look at the films and they would see themselves. So uh, I first came across this footage in 1979 when I was in high school and I had a summer job taking a projector around to different uh, co church congregations in Memphis. We would take Reverend Taylor's films and we would show them to the communities there the, and they would try to identify who was in the footage. And so he was actually a really early inspiration for me as a a young person who was just barely considering becoming a filmmaker. Um, I also wanted to say that I made this film in 1989, which was a very heightened period politically in the United States when people were really first starting to think about sort of the notion of how an image could be political, how who makes an image has an Im impact on what we see in the image, and that, that it was important to kind of know what the point of view was of that maker and where they came from in relationship to the pe people and uh, who were their subjects. So um, the very, one of the very first places I showed this film was at the Robert Flaherty Film Seminar uh, in upstate New York, which is an annual seminar in which people come together to really talk about documentary practice. And that year, the emphasis was on African and African-American filmmakers and films about African-American life. So I was invited there that year. I was one of maybe two other white filmmakers. And it was a very, very charged and interesting experience, but also a very transformative one. One where I connected to dear friends like Zaina Boo Davis and Marlon Riggs and Louis Messiah, all people who've had such a profound effect on African-American filmmaking in the United States. I was, we were all there together. We actually, many of us 
traveled the year later to the Pan-African Film Festival in Burkina Faso in Africa. So that moment of showing sermons and sacred pictures at the Flaherty was really an extraordinary experience for me and one of my favorite um, ex uh, moments as, as an artist. Looking back at that film, especially in the context of this talk about images of the body, I think it's really important to say that I was making a film about Reverend L.O. Taylor, who was an African-American man. I was shooting it in a part of Memphis, Tennessee, my hometown, that was very much a black neighborhood. And I was a white woman. And so I was conscious of that the whole time I was making it. And every time I show it, I'm conscious of it. I tried to, to like lay bare that situation um, as best I could without being explicit, but without announcing myself, without presenting myself in front of the camera. While I was making the film, actually one of my teachers, because it was my graduate thesis film, said, maybe you should show yourself. This was part of the, let's call it confusion, that, that has like that sustains the doc whole documentary practice. To what extent do you explore who you are in relationship to who's in front of your camera? I was still grappling with that and I still am and that's one of the reasons I wanted to make this film. But the film addresses viewing and the film addresses a kind of distinction between my footage, my point of view, and the point of view of, the, of Reverend Taylor uh, and I guess it, those are issues that, that will continue to come around. And they started in the 80s and still in 2020, they're very, very vital. So the next film I'm gonna to show to you uh, really makes a leap uh, in, in that Sermons and Sacred Pictures is a film that uses the archives of Reverend Taylor's films. Uh, now I go from archive material to found footage material, and for me that's very, very, very different. The archive is a material that brings reverence and awe to me, whereas found footage is a place where you can explore irony or irreverence. And so this is a film in which I'm trying to explore how we look at images of science and art and how those images impact how the way that women see themselves. So here's an excerpt from the House of Science. It's the spirit I like. They did nice indeed. I like the spirit when you take charge of yourself. Yes. You won't have anyone messing about. That's how it should be. But you couldn't do it better. Um, have you seen what is the head like? Well, it's covered hair. Yes, but what color? Black. <laughs> Dark hair. Yeah, it looks... <laughs> Does it? You see, it'll come out now showing and then go back. Yes. Popping in and out like that until it gets far enough down to stay out. Yes. Then that's what we call the crowning. Yes. About 20 minutes after that, probably I'll go baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it seems extraordinary that frail women are powerful enough to do all this pushing. I often think that. Turn it another The doctor's office is full of blonde Victorian women patting their stomachs, smiling, Mona Lisa-esque, knowing. They welcome 18-year-old me to their coterie of framed ladies in waiting, waiting for the pop, the baby, and meanwhile, they sell pharmaceuticals. They pose in their nicely framed images, hung ever so carefully around the waiting room of Dr. L. I am waiting, too, for sex, and much, much later, the pop. 
but now it's sex, with a someone I don't know as of yet. It's an abstract meeting, but I want to be prepared. I'm here for one thing, Dr. L, the armor. It's too bad, though. I don't say sex. I say college. Give me a diaphragm, Dr. L, so I can go to college. Yes, he'll give me this shield. The only problem is he doesn't tell me how to use it. I leave his office fully equipped, protected, and completely incapable of placing that plastic, or is it rubber? I'm not sure. Plastic sheath over my cervix. Where is my cervix? I don't know if you want to talk about this, so if you don't want to talk about this, but it's, it's, it, it interests me, but it's not, I mean, it's, it, it's not something yet, but it, do you think that at the time, I mean, that a lot of, for many women, that dealing with that, whether it's abuse or exploitation or whatever from, You've just seen The House of Science, which I made in 1991. It's a half hour film. Uh, the House of Science kind of takes a jump from drawn and quartered in that I take my clothes off a little bit in this film. And in fact, sometimes my family would say, are you gonna ever make a movie where you didn't take your clothes off? Well, honestly, I did not take my clothes off in Sermons and Sacred Pictures. So we can go on from there. Uh, in The House of Science though, I. I wanted to push that that expectation around the images of the of the body in the sense that I wanted to um, explore the nude form but also to to see how we could find this ambiguous zone between the erotic and the uh, uh, pornographic and also somewhere in between where we have this kind of groundedness where the body is celebrated. So those were some, that was something I wanted to do. I also wanted to do something where um, there was again this notion of, a, of collaboration with the person in front of the camera. So you saw the woman rolling down the hill and a big part, I think you did in that footage, I'm not quite sure, but a, when I was shooting that material, uh, uh, I took a friend of mine to, uh, to Death Valley, actually, in Southern California. And I, I asked my friend, Leslie, if she would take her clothes off and roll in the sand. And she said, well, sure, I'm fine about taking my clothes off, but you need to take your clothes off too. And that was actually an awakening moment for me because at first I thought, that's crazy. But then I thought, that actually equalizes us. I felt as vulnerable as she did. I actually rolled around in the sand as well, but there was this time where we both were exposed to the elements. And she, I was exposing her body, but she was also asking me to give something of myself. Um, I also wanted to say that this was the first time of many, many in my work, moments in my work, where I used writing. And it was important to me to bring in something that was uh, as personal as poetry, which I had been doing my whole life prior to that, but also to have the script, to have the gesture, not to type it, but to have that relationship to the body, as in the mind thinks and the hand articulates. And I wanted to have that almost like a fossil so that years later you would find the writing and it would be an emblem of the act of thinking and of the, the moment in which I was trying to come to terms with all aspects of my identity as a woman. So that was uh, uh, a really important period in, in 
that I um, kind of came to, or revelation, let's say, in my own work in this film. The next film that I'm going to show you is Biography of Lilith. And this is, is a film that I made in 1997. And it kind of pairs nicely, I think, with the House of Science, because the House of Science is, is, comes from the point of view of a woman, myself, who hadn't had kids and didn't really have any interest yet in doing that. Um, I was more interested in exploring the moment where a, a young woman decides she's going to have sex and how is she going to not have a baby if she has sex. So um, all about the freedoms that come with that, with sexuality and sensuality. But then I made Biography of Lilith, which I made because I was about to have children and I was interested in the character of Lilith in the Jewish Midrash and in many other cultures. Lilith as this woman who was Adam's first, according to the story, um, according to the Zohar, they say, Lilith was Adam's first partner before Eve, female partner, but Lilith came from the earth, whereas Eve, as you know, came from Adam's rib. And uh, Lilith wanted to be on top in sex, and Adam said no, so he threw her out of the Garden of Eden, or at least he got God to do that. And then the next woman who came along, who was Eve, was much more docile. So this is an excerpt from uh, the biography of Lilith. I'm learning to read all over again, a face this time connected to a body. At first, I feel your story from within. Nose rubs against belly, elbow prods groin. Your silent cough becomes a confusing dip and bulge. You speak, and I struggle to translate. I lie on my side, talk to myself, rub my fingers across my skin from left to right. I read out loud, and I hope you can hear me. I'm learning to read all over again, but this time I have a teacher. San vai, san san vai, se mongolo. San vai, san san vai, se mongolo. Sine, 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 Biography of Lilith, like I said earlier, is really a, a, the first of two projects that, uh, two film projects that I made that really, that help me to allow my filmmaking practice to become a vessel in which I could also explore becoming a mother. So uh, right when I found out that I was pregnant, I decided that I would not only 
have a sonogram where I could see an image of my child, which was a typical thing to do, but I wanted to keep that image and have it become part of my film, Biography of Lilith. So I went to the hospital and I was there in the, the sonography uh, office. <clears throat> And I said to the, the technician, well, I want to film this, <coughs> excuse me. And she told me, well, that's not allowed. Well, I, first of all, actually, I said, can I have the videotape? And she said, no, 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 we can't give it to you. So then I said, well, that's all right. I'll bring my own camera. And so I was there with my husband, Mark, who's also a filmmaker, and we filmed it right off the screen. And therefore, it became a part of the film. So you see my daughter Maya in my belly, and that kind of anticipation become uh, the way that you see an, a child before she's born became part of the film. And interestingly enough, two years later, when I was pregnant with my daughter Noah, I also wanted to film it because I hadn't finished making Biography of Lilith. And by that point, the insurance industry had was so powerful and so protective of the their material of material that might prove liability on the part of the medical system. I was not even allowed to bring a camera in. But at the end of the film, you do see uh, uh, documentation of Maya's birth. So throughout the whole pregnancy and my exploration of the story of Lilith, I also embrace what science will offer me, even if it takes a little backdoor effort um, in the filmmaking. So I wanted to say one other thing about biography of Lilith uh, around the, this image of the body. So I've been talking about the body as a whole, but I want to talk about the face. And um, as you know, traditionally, or the when so an actor is in front of the camera, they put on a lot of makeup. And so I was always very much against that because I wanted to show like the 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 skin as it, it appears in real life. And I wanted to, I was interested in the, the, the lines that, that time left. So I didn't ever ask the woman who was playing Lilith to put on makeup. And as I uh, was first releasing the film, I remember there was a review in a newspaper and the reviewer, a man, said that it was unfortunate that I, that the director of the film, me, had not given makeup to the woman who was performing as Lilith because if she had, she would look better. And so the actress was really, really angry with me about that. And she said, you should have had me put on makeup. And at the time, I felt that makeup was sort of the not feminist thing to do. But also later in life, I, I, I guess as I've gotten older, I thought, why didn't I give her her, her armor? What, what she might have felt would have allowed her to feel stronger. So I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent about that. And I'm sorry that she felt so um, disappointed by, by my own shaping of her image in front of the camera. So the next film I'm going to show you is called Window Work, which is kind of part two to my exploration of motherhood. And this is a film I made, uh, it's a video, so there's, uh, but I made it um, during a residency at the Experimental TV Center in Owego, New York in 2000.
Window work is really my reckoning around not only being a mother, but also how do you figure out who, what your place is in the domestic sphere? Um, not to say I was any good in the domestic sphere, so but I was interested in the, that that obligation that you then have when you have children, you know, to do things like sweep or cook, which I'm not very good at, or um, just to keep that 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 particular cosmos in order. And I was conflicted about that. So I tried to show that in the film and the little boxes that you see in the film are actually home movies from my own childhood. So there's like this little pulse of the past coming into the present. I wanted to tell you that I shot the whole film in, with, in one take and that I was shooting it at the same time as I was performing in it. And that was kind of like a very um, fortuitous thing because I was trying to actually come to a new place around performance and around my um, engagement with the camera. And I also wanted to say that later in life, I realized that interest in um, typical everyday quotidian gestures and even domestic gestures was something, again, that Yvonne Rayner was exploring in her work, particularly in her 1966 film, Trio A, where she extrapolated extrapolates from uh, the, the, the gestures of the everyday and, and cr puts them into a dance. And um, that kind of um, expression on camera, and in this case done in silhouette form, was a very important shift in my work. Okay, um, I'm good. Go for it. Hi, so in 2008, I went down to Buenos Aires with my husband, Mark Street, and our two daughters, Maya and Noah. And we were there, first of all, to learn Spanish, but simultaneously, I had decided that I would make a film inspired by a short story by novelist and short story writer, Julio Cortazar. And the short story was called Fin del Juego, or End of the Game. It was very much a story about girls in their early teens and about the transitions they were making from childhood to being women. And the, the stars of that story, or the protagonists of that story, were four, four girls. So I invited two girls I knew, family friends, to, be, to act in the film with my own daughters, Maya and Noah. And this is the an excerpt from the, 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 uh, the film I ended up making, which was called Wind in Our Hair. The whole film is 45 minutes, but you'll just see it, an excerpt. Envidia. Eh. Envidia. Envidia. Caridad. 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 Vergüenza. 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 Miedo. Miedo, miedo, rencor, 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 celos, 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 generosidad, 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 piedad, 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 sacrificio, 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 
Renunciamiento. Renunciamiento. Ren re renunciamiento. Desaliento. 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 Desengaño. 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 Latrocinio. 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 So you've just watched an excerpt from Wind in Our Hair. And I want to talk a little bit about that in terms of our whole exploration of the body. Uh, one of the things that happened accidentally while we were shooting the film was that it rained and I had had a I had planned to shoot the movie outdoors. So there I was sitting in the living room of this Argentine family's house with a big window at the back of the house. And I realized that I could create a silhouette with the girls bodies. And one of the aspects of the short story by Julio Cortazar was that he had given a list of words uh, to the characters and the characters would move their bodies in front of a, a train or amongst themselves in, in, as a, a reaction to those words. So the, their bodies became like fonts and those bodies became articulations of whole ideas or concepts. And I was very interested in how that could happen. And there you go. We had, it was a rainy day and the, the girls were standing in front of a glass and their bodies became like alphabets or, uh, or, or um, uh, semaphores for something that went beyond the words and beyond their bodies. So it's a very interesting way of working that connected with what I had done previously with window work, which you just saw. And so that was a way to both uh, um, express something about the way they moved, but also to actually move to, to shift away from the specificities of them as characters and just look at them as, as figures or bodies. Um, and I liked that archetypal shift. Um, so the next film that you're going to see is called Same Stream Twice. And it was a, a piece that I that started out as a film called Photograph of Wind and then became Same Stream Twice. And uh, the first time I made the film was in 2001 and then I shot it again in 2010. And I shot it with my daughter, daughter Maya at age six and age 16. So I hope you enjoy it. I wanted to show you a new hobby of mine, which is to decorate old cameras or any kind of filmmaking equipment uh, with fingernail polish. Um, and I'm having a ball doing it. And I just thought I'd show it to you. Uh, okay. So, same stream twice 
was made with a great effort because both times my daughter had absolutely no interest. In fact, she had resistance. So you could probably see that in her look as she's looking back at me. But nevertheless, uh, we persevered and I think she kind of appreciates it now. We actually just shot a new version. Um, she's 24 years old, so it will continue year after year after year. Um, and one of the reasons I called it Same Stream twice is that we are revisiting that circle, that action, but she is different. So it, it, the expression of the, the Greek philosophers thinking was that you can't return to the same stream twice. But epistemologically, uh, in the world of cinema, you can. You can return to moments in history, but they are some, every time you watch a movie, you are returning. So that was very interesting to me and I wanted to play with that with Maya. But the other thing that happens in the film or that I was exploring was the way her eyes look at me and the way I, through the lens of the camera, I'm looking at her. So there's a kind of correspondence that has to do with the way that a parent sees a child, sees the body of a child, and the way the child is looking back at the camera and not seeing someone she doesn't know, but seeing someone she has lived her entire life with, and that is her mother. So that the expressions on her body are those of a, <laughs> of a child seeing someone who is her mother. So that same stream twice. The next movie you're going to see is a is quite a shift from that, the intimacy of that engagement to my film Your Day is My Night, which I shot in Chinatown in New York City in uh, 2011, from 2011 to 2013, which is when it was finished. And I made this in some shift bed apartments where Chinese immigrants uh, were living or are still living uh, in New York City. And so um, this is very much made with people I didn't know. So it comes back to another form of documentary and I'm looking at people and engaging with people in both a hybrid performance and a hybrid filmmaking experience. Uh, and I wanna share that with you and then I'll talk about it. Oh, 我們搶走了我們全部家中的金錢和財富我一想起來我永遠不能忘記我人人呢<笑> 是一個裁縫師又是一個魔術師 the 我一想我就沒有一天我就知道從前的位置
，我哋可以換牀嚟。咁連我哋瞓大個牀人，佢哋呢瞓細個牀人。哦。咁啊，當我呢十四歲嘅時候，嗰、嗯、張牀氈呢成為我自己所有啊、嗯。但係我仍然呢喜歡瞓我細個牀人嗰一邊。四日百花满叶楼，收来百花相伴丝丝柳，目光争光实难求。春光过后会再回头，痴心爱伴世间最难求。你莫要得。花落心酸口，要尽春花开甘愁。我要等，我要等，我要等，飘丝丝后，并蒂花，只心有，心是你。Okay, so you've just seen a scene from Your Day is My Night, a scene with two women, uh, Ellen Ho and Linda Chan. And uh, I wanted to show that scene because I wanted to, sit, to show you something about, about listening, about the way that I try to shoot with people when they in a documentary mode, but also in a mode in which the person on this, in the within the frame there are two people within the frame and one is receiving information ideas words from the other so it's not just about the listening of the audience but the listening of someone on screen uh, so clearly i'm not asian i'm not chinese and i was intending to make a film in chinatown and so there is always that kind of wonder about how i am filming people who are very different from me. Uh, and that was similar to what I talked about when I was showing you sermons and sacred pictures. And so uh, the, the shooting for Your Day is My Night happened over two years because at first I was making a film, then it, we had Hurricane Sandy and so many different things were disrupted and we started to make a live performance which, which we showed at uh, University Settlement House and small theaters and other spaces, performance spaces around New York. And then we went back to making a film. So we had a lot of time to get to know each other and a lot of ways in which we became dear friends, but there was always a language barrier because sadly I don't speak Chinese. So there's the language barrier, there's a cultural barrier, there's so many different things that would prevent us from really knowing each other. But yet through it all, we became very close 
uh, mostly through translators who are always with us. So I tried to give the sense in the film that we are both in proximity with the people who live in those apartments, but we're also outsiders. And I'm, I guess I was okay with acknowledging my own voyeurism, uh, that, uh, that sense of opening the door on someone else's life. And that's why I tried to create differences in texture between the digital, which is very precise, and other more dreamy film-like material, and all these different ways that I tried to, to acknowledge that space between their lives and my own. So the next film that I'm going to show you is called And Then We Marched. And this is a film I made in 2017. It's a, all of four minutes, so you're going to see the whole thing. And I made it at the Women's March in Washington, D.C. So what do, we, what do you think women were maybe unhappy about and why were they marching? Uh, well, because they want the same things as men. They want to be able to do the same things as men and they want to... And hmm, Okay. It used to happen um, with voting. Mm-hmm. Like what? What? What happened with voting? Well, men weren't allowed to vote. I think the men would go out to vote, and the women would just be stuck doing other stuff. And then we made our signs. Tell me about that. I think I wrote women's work, women's rights, mm -hmm. on it. Yeah, I drew the American flag, but other than that, I'm not sure what I drew. Yeah. Do you still have your sign? Well, me and Mommy lost it on the way there, but I think we still have Mommy's sign somewhere. It was kind of weird because at, because when the yelling started it like it was all just really quiet and then someone would say something and then after that the people would repeat and then it kept on going on and on and then at some point it stopped. I think one of them would I think it, at some point someone started um we want equal something like we want equal rights something like that well i don't really know how i felt it was a bunch of mixed feelings that i couldn't really make out happy and excited and maybe just a little tiny bit scared. Well, it was different because you don't usually get to do that for any reason. Do what? Like, go out on the streets and yell about equal rights and stuff. We want equal rights. You just watched and then we marched. Uh, that was a very short film you saw. As I said, you'd see the whole thing that I shot 
uh, with people I didn't know at all. Of course, I went to the Women's March with my daughter Noah, my husband Mark, my brother Ira, and then my daughter Maya was also there, but none of them ended up in any of that footage at all. I was really filming people who were strangers to me, but yet we were kindred spirits. We were there because we were really upset about the 2016 election, and we wanted to find a way to speak out about women's concerns to the world. So I shot the film silent. I shot it with my Super 8 camera. I was there observing people in a moment of anger, in a moment of protest, an activist moment. So there was a way that they spoke to me through their signs and through their bodies. They were speaking, they were passionate about something that, about a moment in history that had very much disturb them and they wanted to meet in Washington DC and speak about this but they didn't I didn't listen to them with my camera or with the microphone so when I got back to New York City I had to figure out how do I give it another level of voice and I did that by actually having a conversation so when we speak about the body we're also speaking about the voice I had a conversation with my seven-year-old next-door neighbor who lives right there <laughs> and I asked her how her experience of the Women's March here in New York had been, and that's what you heard. So uh, the next film that I'm going to see takes a leap, a leap away from a child's experience to the experience of three women, heroes of mine, film, three of the best filmmakers on the earth, whom I happen to know, and who have been dear friends of mine through actually most of my life as a filmmaker. Not most of my life, but my life as a filmmaker, my career. So this film is called Carolee, Barbara, and Gunver, and I made it with a uh, feminist, uh, performance artist, filmmaker, and painter, Carolee Schneemann, uh, Barbara Hammer, lesbian experimental filmmaker, and Gunver Nelson, Swedish experimental filmmaker. Gunver had been a teacher, Barbara had been, well, someone who taught me how to do optical printing and filmmaking, but also a dear friend. And Carolee was a, a, a dear friend and, and comrade in the world of art in New York City. So I shot this over a period of time with the three of them, and now I share it with you. I like to use my body in performance, either with a camera or without a camera, but moving on a trapeze, hiking, performing in my space with my furniture and my cameras, or using a movie. And it goes all the way back to 1968, 67, when I had an 8 millimeter and a Super 8, and I would film myself in the woods. It caught the activity and the energy that is part of my personality. Using a moving camera expresses who I am and to have a camera that I can be fluid with, that I can hold in my hand, it can be as changeable as my identity can be. Someone gave me a Super 8 camera and I decided I should go to school and learn how to be a filmmaker. So I drove my motorcycle to Sonoma State but on the way, I saw this little house in Bodega that was covered with red ivy. And I parked my motor scooter, or cycle it was at the time, and I went inside the house. And I saw through these cobwebbed windows all this beautiful um, display of red leaves. And in my pocket, I had asked my optometrist for any old lenses he had. And he had bifocal lenses. And I took them out and put them in front of the lens when I was shooting so I could see in two different ways. So I would shoot a little and then pull it away. So it would go from blurry to clear. Sometimes you'd see a line in the middle like you see in bifocals. And this was a perfect way to express myself. I felt interiorly then, just through experimenting, that I found out how I could make the inside of myself show on the outside. This film became skitzy because I was living in a man's world and I was a woman and I felt like I had two different roles that I needed to play. I could be the assertive, I used the name Agressa at the time, or I could be feminine Barbara and, you know, make my way in the world if that's what was called for. 
So the section you just saw was the one third of the film, and that was the section on Barbara Hammer. There, was, there isn't time in this talk for me to include all of them, and I decided to include Barbara Hammer's section because um, I've ac I actually worked with her a great deal over the last year of her life, and uh, I thought that section worked almost like a little mini film. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was how do you articulate something with your camera that talks about love, affection, admiration for someone who's in front of your camera that also gives them energy, that also says this is a person in motion, this is a person who has uh, invested a lot in filmmaking herself. So you want to say, you, you want to say something about her moment as an artist, but you also want to bring an art practice or sensibility to the shooting. So that's what I was trying to do with Barbara. And we were we had to play around so that she wasn't always just standing, like I am doing right now, but she was interacting with uh, cameras on the table or a, sh uh, a blind in her studio. All of that gave a kind of energy to, to her body and to her presence in the frame. So the next film I'm going to show you is called um, A Year of Notes and Numbers. It's only three minutes, it's silent, and it's a film I made with uh, to-do lists that I had written over exactly one year in 2017, and also the numbers of my medical reports, the blood work that I got from my doctor. I hope you enjoy it. A Year of Notes and Numbers is probably the film that is most about my body, and yet my body's not in it, nobody is in it. And that was actually the, the artistic challenge, the conundrum of that investigation, and that was to how to talk about um, uh, the elements of uh, what comprises our body and the and our mind, because I had my notes to, to myself and things that I needed to do, how to bring that all together in a, in a way that would um, uh, somehow talk about or reveal those mind-body uh, conflicts and um, parallel journeys. So, uh, because they are parallel, your blood must travel with you as you take care of all the business that is in your life. So that was a kind of the, the, the part of my work that had to do with also getting older. Like at that moment in my life, um, anecdotally, I was very concerned about my blood sugar. So I was not only looking at those numbers, but responding to them in, a, in an emotional way. Um, so the last film that I'm gonna talk about is The Washing Society. And The Washing Society started as uh, a perform live performance that I made with my dear friend um, co -direct and co-director, playwright Lizzie Olesker. And we started as making a live performance in laundry mats 
all over New York City, mostly in Brooklyn actually, in Manhattan, and that we were interested in the in the nature of work in laundry in laundromats, how people would uh, engage with one another, the people, the service people, the people who actually touch your clothes, and the other people whose uh, who's shirts and skirts and pants and socks were being cleaned. And what was that, that was convergence of, of their beings. Like, so the, the clothing, what became in a sense, the extension of their bodies. So I hope you enjoyed this section of the Washing Society. I started working in a laundromat when I turned 15. I'm 60 now, so that's 45 years. And I work only part-time, five or six days a week, six to seven hours a shift. And each day, I do about 10 to 15 loads of laundry. So that's 70 loads a week, 280 a month, 3,360 a year. On a normal day, on a normal nine-hour day, um, I do myself, I'm not saying they're all heavy, but I do no less than 25 to 26 bags a day. I think that I fold over a thousand pieces of clothes a day. And, and you know, just little articles, socks, you know, underwear. All of them have to be turned inside out one by one. Every piece counts. So that's about 72 loads a week, including the store loads. And my oldest child is 41 now, so that would be 3,744 loads a year. Is that possible? If I had to say, I say I would say I would fold a thousand pieces a day or more. Uh, a week, it would probably be, so four, I'm working four times a week at this moment, so it's It'll be like 4,000 pieces a week. So in a month, it would be over 12,000 pieces. And that's just what I think. I could be more. I know it can't be less. I know it's more. July 1881, 20 African-American laundresses meet to form the Washington Society. They demand respect and control over their work. They go door to door asking other laundresses across the city to join their strike. In three weeks, the Washington Society grows from 20 to 3,000 strikers. So you just watched an excerpt from the Washing Society, which was completed in 2018 and it's 45 minutes long. And it's the last film I'm going to talk about today, but it's a film I thought was really important in my in exploration of the body in cinema, um, the presence of the somatic um, uh, entity that is our corpus. Uh, and that is that I needed to talk about work and work is so much a part of our waking time on this earth, but so often we, we actually veer towards something like recreation and we look at art, art as a time to investigate 
leisure, or people do. But we were really, Lizzie and I were really interested in looking at the repetitive gestures, and, and like Yvonne Rayner, again in Trio 1, looking at the ways that those gestures have a kind of aesthetic um, exuberance and brilliance in a way that we can look at what has often be, been seen as reproductive labor or invisible labor that contributes enormously to our culture, especially the work by women that has been ignored, work that is essentially domestic work, but done in a public space. So we wanted to celebrate that and to give uh, the, the film a place to give us the chance to talk to people about that work. So we were looking at laundromat workers, both in a contemporary way, but also laundry workers going back to the late part of the 19th century, the women of the wash, the original washing society from 1881 who worked collectively, who brought their bodies together, African American women in Atlanta, Georgia, came together to protest and to demand higher wages for their work. And in that collective action, they were actually able to, uh, to, to create change, to get what they wanted from their labor, and Lizzie and I were really committed to, to bringing that to the screen. So that was part of the work we did with the Washing Society, uh, and now you've seen a lot of my work, not all of it, but um, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation around uh, my body, your body, our bodies, and somatic cinema at home and in the world. Thank you to uh, my daughter, Noah Street Sachs, who's shooting right now, and to my husband, Mark Street, who shot other parts of this talk. Um, it's been a, a, like a lot of fun considering the challenges that we're all going through with the coronavirus. And I hope all of you are he healthy and finding happiness in some way.